Hello. In this section, we are going to uh, do a quick review of two other types of machine learning approaches. One is a probabilistic approach, and underlying that, we are looking at Gaussian process regression, GPR. And the other one are ensemble methods such as um, random forest, which we're going to go over them quickly after this. In each of these cases, a Python code has been provided where you can play with the Python code and look at the effect of different assumptions and fitting data. So first I'm going to explain what GPR is and then what are some main assumptions underlying GPR. And these are again traditional machine learning approaches. There is no physics involved here. Uh, but when we get to the physics informed approach, this becomes important if you're familiar with these um, assumptions. So the whole um, assumption for when an approach like GPR is like this, you have a set of um, data, and in this case we have a small data. A few experiments have been done, for example, where we are varying one parameter in this case, and we are looking at one outcome, y. And you might want to ask a few questions. Um, you might want to ask, in the area that we have the data, uh, what function predicts the data? But you don't want to do it in a very specific way. Um, you want to say, this is the function that presented, but I'm not confident about this function. There might be a zone that you are um, less confident, and there might be a zone that you are more confident. So you're looking at the zone that represents the underlying behavior here. But maybe there is a mean response, and maybe then there is like a upper bound 95% uh, accuracy, and then 5% lower percentile accuracy type. Uh, estimation. So that's the first thing you want to know. The second thing is maybe there are some areas where you don't have any data. And um, you want to know what is the prediction of the model in this case. Uh, again, in a probabilistic manner. And the third thing you might want to answer is this, that um, yes, uh, I know some data, but is there a specific value for x um, that might maximize or minimize this function. What are these value of x? You're looking for um, specific location that the values are maximized or minimized. And this is very similar to the example I mentioned before, comparing uh, GPR with design of experiments with one factor at a time. So this follows the same logic. So again, there is an underlying maybe true response maybe deterministic, but you don't know that and you are not after finding that response. What you're trying to find is a zone of all the random functions that might go through these points but satisfy some assumptions. Uh, and that's the underlying assumption, um, the GPR. There are two main things um, that comes uh, as an assumption um, for GPR. I'm going to look into that. One of them is the fact that uh, you're assuming a normal distribution, and we're going to describe what that is. So there's a normal distribution. And the other thing is, which people typically neglect, but that becomes quite important for us, is the kernel function. So we're going to look at both of these things. So if you look at um, there's a random functions that are going through these points and represents the true response, for example. They satisfy some assumptions. First of all, these are all um, continuous functions. There is no jumps in these functions. Right? So that's one main assumption you might take. Or you might want to modify some of these things to, um, to have a non-continuous function. For our course, we're going to assume that all of these functions are continuous. Two, if you look at the area that you have a distribution like here, um, these distributions are something like this. So you have an area where you have um, lots of random function going through, and then it becomes less and less. So we assume that this distribution follows a normal distribution. That's the second assumption we make. So if you get another random points, and you look at the distribution of these random functions, it follows a normal distribution as well. And then the, the second important thing is about the kernel. And the kernel, you can think about it as a high-level function here, a high-level shape of the function. Because I can assume that um, these points, they follow a random, they follow um, more or less like a linear uh, function. And you will have like um, randomly, this randomly linear functions going through them. So that could be an assumption I make. Um, but 
the shape that I have assumed doesn't follow this. It's more like a sinusoidal shape I have assumed here. Um, that's high level shape. You can think about it as kernel. It's not a good definition, but maybe it's a good intuition of what kernel means. It sort of like represents correlation between data. So uh, I'll explain it in more details. So again, to summarize, Gaussian process regression is a probabilistic approach to machine learning. You're not trying to find a function that best represents the data, but you're trying to find a zone that the true underlying response might go through that zone. And this becomes quite interesting. With that zone, you can kind of predict where um, that function becomes maximum or minimum. So this can guide your efforts to do experiments in those zones, if you are interested in maximizing or minimizing a behavior. In experiments, it typically becomes quite important. You don't want to just go and randomly do tests, because again, tests are expensive. So you want to guide your experimental efforts. So that's why GPR has become quite an important uh, consideration, important application to machine learning. OK, so um, there are some mathematics. And again, that's potential maximum minimum. Okay, and there are some uh, mathematics here, which I'm not going to go into details if you're interested. Um, I provided the slides, you can go through that. I'm more interested now in the intuition that this um, assumption for kernel implies. There is a Python code that's been provided, gprkernel.py, and in the Python code, you can, there is a data set, very small data set, six or seven data points. And you can train a GPR model to go through these data points by selecting different um, kernel functions. And these are some widely used kernel functions. Um, and again, uh, you have to know the terminologies if you want to use this. So there is the radial basis function, or RBF, which is sort of like an exponential decay function, uh, which implies that when the points are close to each other, um, the functions are going to go through the points. And when you move away from the points, you have a divergence in the response. So it's a, the confidence level drops, and you have um, a larger zone that the true function might go through. Um, there's a more advanced function, which we are not going to use in this course, but a matern or a rational quadratic or other types. Um, you might assume that the function, this uh, function that truly represents these points are linear. So you can imply that in GPR by selecting a um, kernel function, which is called dot product. And you can do that in the GPR Python, uh, GPR kernel Python code. You can set my kernel is a dot product, and you will see this um, outcome. Or you can say is um, power three. Or you can say that um, there's a lot of noise in my data. So you add a noise kernel to your other kernels that says there's a base function that represents the behavior, but then you have very low confidence in data. So you go further away from data points and you have a zone that represents uh, the underlying response. The bottom line here is selection of kernel is very important in the accuracy of a GPR approach. When we get to the physics-informed machine learning, you will see that how we enforce our physical understanding to training a GPR by properly selecting the kernel. But again, I'm not going to go into details of the Python coding here. When we get to the case example uh, for GPR, we're going to look into that. Even if you select a base kernel, like here, RBF, which if you remember is the exponential decay and noise, there are parameters that go into these functions, um, hyperparameters, we call them. When you're training a Gaussian process regression model, you're actually selecting the best parameters of those base functions. Think about this sort of like a high-level activation function for GPR. Um, so RBF is an exponential decay, and there's a parameter L that um, describes how fast the decay happens. And the noise, it has a parameter C in this case that represents how much noise you have in data. So in the GPR intro, you can set these parameters. Um, I set them such that you don't need to, uh, when you're training them, the, uh, the algorithm doesn't change these parameters, just for you to see um, the shape that it predicts after training. So you can say that um, I have, um, between these two cases, um, both cases are following this uh, exponential decay function. Uh, with the same length of scale L. One of them has no noise, the other one has noise. So when you have noise, what it does is that it just increases that zone of uh, um, 
confidence. Basically, you have less confidence now in the, in the data. So your true function might go into a larger zone. Then if you compare the, the last case with the first case, um, there's no noise, but you're playing with the, um, this length scale. So what it does, if you shorten the length scale, the decay happens in the shorter time um, in this case. So basically, even the points that are closer together, there is no line going between them. You have a zone that goes between them. Um, and again, these are part of the hyperparameters. When we are training a GPR model, we are actually playing with these parameters during training. The second type of approach I want to describe are ensemble methods. I'm going to first start with decision tree, which becomes the basis for those ensemble methods I'm going to describe. And I'm going to describe it with a very simple example. Let's say I have, um, this is sort of like a classification approach, but I have um, a domain of x and y <clears throat> with some data. Some of the data are pink, some of the data are yellow. And I want to have um, a model that tells me if I have a yellow dot or I have um, a pink dot. And this is a simple decision tree. It basically says that I have like four quadrants and then in one zone I have pink and then I have zone I have yellow and so on and so forth. So it says um, if x is less than zero, false and true, if y is less than zero, false and true, and you arrive at four conclusion. So this is sort of like a decision tree. Uh, we call it one estimator. It has um, two levels. And at the end, it has four leaves. So there are um, like a, it's like a tree. It has branches, and eventually it has um, leaves at the end. Um, and we're going to use this as a basis for other um, ensemble methods we're going to learn. There are two ensemble types of ensemble methods. And um, under each of them, I have selected one or two methods to describe. And we're going to use them in the 3D printing case study. There is a bagging approach, which um, I'll describe in more details, and there's a boosting approach. In the bagging approach, you get a bunch of baseline um, decision trees, and each of them predicts an outcome, and you do an average of prediction. And sometimes it gives you higher accuracy just compared to baseline um, decision tree. In the boosting approach, you train a decision um, tree model, and then step by step, you're improving its accuracy. Um, and we are going to use two types of boosting method, gradient boosting machine and XGB regressor. And uh, without going too much into the details of the mathematics of them, I provided you uh, one Python code that you can play with. Um, and it sort of like follows the same logic as the previous one. We have a parabolic function. Remember, we tried to fit this function using, uh, um, we actually tried to fit this using both GPR and using neural networks. Um, here we are trying to fit it using um, decision trees. So this is a random forest. Um, so in the Python code random forest intro, you can play with these parameters. I'm going to show you how it looks like. There are two trees, and each tree has a maximum depth of three branches, and then you will end up with five leaves at the end for each of the maximum. And the prediction can sort of like um, give you the intuition. It's like we are combining a bunch of delta function, line, segment, line segments, to um, approximate to present this. I can increase the number of leaves. I can increase the number of depths. I can increase the number of estimators. In this case, if I increase the number of um, leaves, I will get a lot more lines. Um, but why do we get lines? Um, this shows you what the trained model looks like. There are two trees, and um, each of them try to predict why. Each tree, again, has three levels. And there are five uh, leaves in each um, tree. So there is one, which is this one here. Uh, it basically goes, if x is um, less than 7.6, goes one direction or the other direction. If it's not less, it gives you one y value. And then uh, at the end, it gives you one, two, three, four, and five options. Um, so you can end up with any of these predictions, but it's a constant prediction for y. And then the other tree does the same thing, but the parameters of the tree is different. So you get the y1 prediction of one tree, y2 prediction of the other tree, and then you get an average of them, which is the prediction of the overall both trees. Um, so overall, what it does is that it's like it says, if x is between these two parameters, this is the value. If x is between this parameter, this is the value. And it becomes uh, multi-segmented lines trying to predict this parabola function. So uh, 
in any of these models, as you could see, you can increase the complexity of the model to properly capture this. Remember, if you had a neural network which is not too accurate, um, too complex, you don't get this accuracy. Um, but as an overview, let's go back and check at the predictions of different models. These are the predictions of neural network trying to predict um, quadratic function. And as you're increasing the complexity of the baseline functions or the architecture, you can capture it properly. Um, the main parameters you're selecting here is an activation function, ReLU, or Tanner hyperbolic in this case, and also how complex is the architecture. And you will end up with somehow capturing the shape that you want to capture. If you go to um, Gaussian process regression, it's the same um, quadratic function shape that you want to capture. Um, depending on what we choose as kernel, you will end up with very different um, outcomes. So this becomes quite sensitive to um, selection of kernel. In this case, kernel is um, basically um, uh, has the same effect as activation function and architecture of a neural network, if you, if you will. And then finally, if you have a decision tree like this, a random forest like this, it tries to predict this using um, multi-segments, uh, linear segments. Uh, so each of them gives you an approximation. We are not saying any of them is better than the other one. In each case, you have to try them uh, and see which one fits better. But uh, we are not going to do that in the next case study. So as I mentioned, there are four case studies we're going to go over in the next courses, in the next lectures. Each of them, we are going to select one of these baseline algorithms, do a baseline prediction for that machine learning algorithm, and then um, enhance the approach by um, implementing physics into training.